Hello and welcome to my channel. Today we're looking into the disappearance of Melanie Etchier, which I had to look up to try to find the pronunciation of her last name because I had no idea. So, And I really would not have pronounced that correctly. But this is what we're looking in today. And they said her name was pronounced Melanie Nadia Etchier and that she was called Mel. And we're going to look. This is how far she had to walk. She had to walk from Pine Avenue East somewhere over in here. She It was a 10-minute walk. So she only had to walk. If she, if she went this way and didn't go another way. This is all she would have had to walk. Somewhere in here. I don't know where at on Church Street. But it was a short, short walk. And I'm not even sure how far down Pine Avenue she had to walk. So, I mean, the walk was so short. So, and then they have information on Reddit. And they have information on Wikipedia. And Wikipedia says that she was born December 25th, 1980. She was a Canadian teenager who disappeared. And I don't know how to pronounce that either. So, but she disappeared in Ontario in 1996. And it says as of 2022, her whereabouts and the circumstances of her disappearance remain unknown. I don't know why they call them by their last names. That bothers me. Anyway, so it says that Melanie was an honor student and she was described as being the salt of the earth and having a lovely personality. And she was the daughter, her mother's name was Celine and their family had moved to the area when she was six years old and she had acted as a second mother to her younger sister Jessie who was five years old in September of 1996. She was one of only three black girls in the community and Melanie's father with whom she had no relationship was from Botswana, I don't know how to pronounce that either, and met her mother while attending a mining school so, but relocated to another school during the pregnancy and returned to Africa once his school schooling was complete. At the time of her disappearance, the combined population of the town that she lived in and its neighboring communities was roughly about 11,000. So, and talks about, is that her that was employed at a local daycare? And learning self-defense from a family friend. She intended to become a teacher after graduating from high school. Um, the daycare she worked at was attached to her high school. And Melanie would open the facility early in the morning, go to school, return after school to help the younger children off the bus, and remained until it closed in the evening. Her mother also worked at the daycare while taking college courses. So in September of 1996, Melanie was five foot five inches tall. She weighed about 120 pounds. She had brown eyes and long braided black hair. She was fond of wearing hair extensions. She had not been diagnosed with any mental illness and she was not taking any medications and friends who knew her at the time of her disappearance do not believe she was suffering from any undiagnosed condition because she was an honor student. She was working so on the morning of September 28th, it said she visited the home of her mother's close friend and only Melanie, the mother's close friend and a six-year-old daughter, Stephanie, were present at the house as the others were out of town. During the visit, uh, Melanie broke a nail, which caused her to become upset because, oh, her broken nail, she think it was because she was, is that her or her mother? I don't know. As a car had broken down and phone service to their house had been cut off. She left the home and traveled downtown by chance running into her best friend, so that's her, at a bus stop outside of the public library. <clears throat> her friend who had been doing homework in the library decided to abandon her schoolwork and join Melanie. 
The two girls visited several locations, including a pizza pizza where they had lunch. Over pizza, Melanie floated the idea of becoming a teacher and volunteering um, in the country where her father was from. She um, purchased candles, frosting, candy hearts, and a new cake pan to make a cake for her grandmother's birthday party, which was going to be celebrated the next day before her grandparents went out of town. They also visited a house in nearby Diamond to collect, I think that's how you pronounce it, money from someone that she had babysat for that owed her some money, I guess. So, yeah. And then they met up with Melanie's boyfriend. And I guess she'd been dating him for three weeks. And then their other friends, Dave and Jay and Ryan and... They said she was in a good mood that day and that night. And then they stopped at a video rental store. <clears throat> Remember the video rental stores? And I love the way they do the hours differently. So, yeah. So, it's military time. And 24 is midnight, so... This is three hours before midnight. So that would have been about 9 o'clock, 9.30, and rented a, the movie Sudden Death. And then about 10 o'clock, the group arrived at Melanie's home to watch the movie, but her mother was spending time with Melanie's grandmother in their living room and suggested that her bedroom was too disorderly for house hosting guests. So... They went somewhere else to find a place to watch the movie. They tried to watch it at the home of one of the people's girlfriends who was unable to do it there. So then they, I don't know, it just talks about they went from house to house. And and then one of the friends complained it was getting cold outside. I don't know. So... And this is, this is 2200, so this is 22, I don't know. Anyway, the group went to the house on Pine Avenue where Ryan lived. And his parents were there, but they remained in their bedroom. And one of the people returned home. And it says the house was about a 10-minute walk. And we looked at that, so it's about six blocks, it says. So the teen watched the movie quietly in the basement while the parents were sleeping. And they said they didn't drink or do any drugs or anything like that. They just watched the movie. And then one of the other people left. And then... So they were leaving. But... One of them... One of the girls, when she left, it said she encountered a suspicious vehicle while slowly... That slowly approached her as she crossed through the intersection as if it was assessing her. The girl said she was unnerved by the incident. And that she ran away to the next intersection by the bridge, which was better lit. She followed the same route that Mel is thought to have taken to Melanie's home. Where her grandparents were waiting to take her home. Or something. I don't know. Anyway... One of them arrived at Melanie's residence shortly before one, catching the last few minutes of Saturday Night Live before being driven home. The vehicle she'd encountered has been described as a white or light color. They think it was a Chevy Monte Carlo or similar two-door model with signs of being in poor condition, including a gray patch on the right side, which was likely hiding a hole or other damages. The witness believed the occupants were two teenage boys or young men, but she can't remember even seeing the car again. And when she left, only three people remained in the house. So, And then it says the last confirmed sighting of Melanie was around 1.32 a.m. on September 29, 1996, when she left her friend's house and she began walking home. And 
They said it was not it was uncommon for her to walk by herself, but without phone service, she couldn't call home for a ride. So one of the boys escorted her to the door and watched her walk west down Pine Avenue East. At this time, she was wearing a green Nike windbreaker, a white t-shirt, and it talks about her clothes and what she was wearing. So, and she had a necklace and a watch. Um, she It said her route would have taken her through three intersections, over the Armstrong Bridge, past the gas station and apartment building, up a back alley or along a main road, and finally to the top of Church Street where her residence was located. So here it is. So she, yeah, so that, such a short walk, right? And I don't know if she went this way or not, right? So three intersections. Yeah. It said she typically preferred to use the back alley when making this journey. The bridge was the only portion of her route that was brightly lit, and the street would have been reasonably busy even at the late hour when she was crossing it. After the bridge, the last stretch of her walk involved a poorly lit back road where the video rental store she had visited early in the day was located. The weather was clear as it had been two days since the previous full moon and it is believed there would have been some natural light along her route. Um, her mother became aware of her daughter's absence the next morning when the alarm clock roused her at around 6 or 7.30 and she discovered her daughter was not in her bedroom. As it was not uncharacteristic of her to spend the night at a friend's, her mom went back to bed and didn't wake up again till 8 or 9. Her grandparents arrived at the house about 10 to celebrate her grandmother's birthday, at which point Melanie was supposed to have finished preparing the cake she had bought materials for the day before. Her mother didn't immediately suspect anything due to Melanie's habit of responsible behavior. She was alarmed when it became clear Melanie had not made it home the night before. Her mother and her father drove to Tim Horton's to purchase a cake and call around in hopes of reaching Melanie where she learned her daughter had left the Chatwin residence heading home. Melanie also did not appear at her daycare job as scheduled, prompting her mother to phone the police around one in the afternoon and report Melanie missing. So that's 12 hours later. So then the search begins and they said it begins in the afternoon around 3.34 o'clock, and the police dispatch offers to the officers to the residents and they began a search of the area around the bridge and along the banks of the river within hours of her being reported missing. And they also asked, requested assistance from the Ontario police on, the, on Monday the 30th and a helicopter and a police dog team and a search rescue dog from the Fire Marshal were dispatched to expand the search around Pine Avenue, as were an OPP emergency search and rescue team. And this is so sad. So that's the day after, isn't it? More than a dozen police officers and volunteer firefighters canvassed the area where Esther had last been sighted and police forces, they were alerted. They went, they conducted door-to-door -door canvas. No homes in the area were searched. Police stated that they checked all surveillance video taken along her route the night she vanishes, as well as a visitor's log in the Will Inn Motel near Pine Avenue. Two police officers were assigned to lead the investigation and were joined by two detectives from the major's crime unit units. So during the first week of October, all the friends who were with Esther the night of her disappearance were questioned. In the days following, police surveillance was conducted on three local girls who may have, they thought they may have been in the intended targets. But I don't know. These girls, other local teens, one, there was one that was an exotic dancer, they said, who bore a strong resemblance to Melanie and... 
they said that they were mistaken sometimes by people. So, and then on the weekend, one week after this disappearance, they performed training exercises in the area and participated in the search. And then they had the underwater search and rescue team began. And they searched the river, they searched along the bridge. So, and then they also had military transport aircraft was used to search the area. So they, they've searched and searched. So by mid-October, her case was listed with Crime Stoppers, Crime Stoppers, and the public was implored to phone in tips, which could help the investigators locate her. Search teams were unable to find any signs indicating where Melanie had disappeared from or where she was taken. Since there was no evidence had been recovered in the case, so according to Melanie's family, a single item may have been recovered by police on the first day of the search and never paid, made public. Its statements to the media made it clear to detectives believed she had no reason to leave the community and they suspected foul play. Uh, they never recovered any security footage from the Night Owl convenience store located one block away from the Pine Avenue resident. Shortly after her disappearance, missing persons posters and billboards with her picture were put up in the, that small city and the surrounding communities. And some of these remained in place as of 2020 and others since have been replaced. Um, they said they've got a, a well-known billboard that says, you know what happened to me, so why don't you help? And it has a photo of her. So her mother and volunteers from the community and some of the friends, they went around distributing posters to that area and nearby communities. Um, there was a letter written to the editor published in November and set information about Melanie to media companies in hopes of keeping attention on the case. Um, Child Find, a national charity dedicated to finding missing children and supporting their families, have begun circulating information. Said in 97, 98, two officers assigned to work the case full time. They interviewed witnesses in early 1997 in order to exhaust all possible leads. This is, still, you know, a long time after. So, uh, to me, you know, if, if something happens to you, it just seems like forever so the the task force dedicated to searching for her was disbanded in 1998 but people tried to they still had people trying to work on the case if they got new leads it says and you can read along and actually read what it says I'm just like skimming it but two officers interrogated hundreds of suspects and persons of interest they conducted another search for her, April 26, 1999, focusing on a different area, which had previously not been investigated. And 2000 police seized materials from the landfill in an area as part of the investigation. Uh, shortly before Christmas, 1996, the, they doubled the reward money. It says, It talks about them joining with neighboring communities. The OPP took over the law enforcement in the community in 2007. Uh, Jennifer Smith later admitted that some tips issued to the police about the case may not have been passed on during the transfer of duties. In 2010, an eyewitness account of her crossing the bridge was made public and more details of the sighting were released. According to the witness, she and her husband were driving across the bridge and they both spotted a teenage black girl walking south on the eastern sidewalk. The night was clear and they saw no vehicle or other pedestrians on the bridge. At the time of this sighting, the girl was closer to the north end of the bridge. The witness commented that the girl seemed to be too young to be alone at night but was walking unbothered at normal place while her husband remarked that he was not aware that there were any black girls that lived there although the witness believed the girl's hair may have been in dreadlocks it is possible that she from from where she was looking misidentified the braid extensions that melanie wore 
and they were they didn't report their account to the police till 97 or 98 when they saw the photo the tip was not properly logged into the police records and it would not be investigated until the 2000s when witnesses approached the mother directly at which point were urged to revisit the sighting police said they were not made aware of the witness account until 2008 a second witness came forward in 2008 2009 to state that they had seen her on the armstrong street bridge that night according to the witness they had been at king george tavern located two blocks from the south end of the bridge until about 1 a.m when they picked up food and coffee at a nearby restaurant and they were being driven home they spotted a girl near midway point of the bridge from her back seat view the witness saw the girl walking on the bridge's western sidewalk and when the car pulled up and two young men exited the vehicle the boys then proceeded to corner the girl and coerce her into entering their vehicle before speeding off the witness recalled the vehicle being a small blue or light colored sedan but could not remember what the girl she saw looked like and this is a long time after so I don't know why they're coming forward with it then and I don't know and he expresses doubt to the authenticity of this version of events in the state of the media reports about some of the sightings have caused non-credible tips from people so and I don't know how they'd know which night it was after all that time another witness who had lived on Rebecca Street just off Pine Avenue and near Docs took her story to police in 2019. This witness, known only as Denise, disclosed that around 1.45, she was doing schoolwork in her room when she heard a girl screaming outside. Although she initially ignored the outburst, she heard more screaming about 45 seconds later and became frightening frightened after checking that her front door was locked the witness snuck to her bay window and saw three silhouettes of people running down the street towards pine avenue but no vehicle or headlights what lived off lived on rebecca street where's rebecca street right here so she's just leaving and then she's running off right away and they hear her screaming but somebody else said they saw her crossing the bridge and seems i don't know that's so i don't know anyway and then they in 2020 they declassified parts of the female friend's account of the evening which she described being spooked by a vehicle after leaving the pine avenue residence this friend has only ever spoken to the media about her experience twice and has since moved overseas the release of the next call podcast about her case from the creator of someone knows something led to another witness coming forward in 2021 the anonymous male witness was unknown to investigators before getting in touch after hearing the podcast. The tip led police to um, a field in North Cobalt, roughly 10 kilometers from Esther's last known, and they surveyed this site with the assistance of search dogs and drones in October 2021. The heavily forged terrain made looking for evidence this difficult and the police suggested they would have to schedule additional days to continue searching the area. So that's scary. What if somebody was outside? What if somebody knew where she was and was outside waiting for her to leave? The police investigation into her disappearance has remained active since 1996. The investigation is currently handled by... I don't know how to say that but in collaboration with the OPP crime unit and that's who is leading it Rob Matthews if that's I don't know if that's who's still leading it so anyway there's information $50,000 reward for information that leads to an arrest or conviction of those responsible $50,000 that's a decent amount of money anyway all of the information about the case has been uploaded to power case 
a newly implemented major case management system which alerts detectives to similar details in other investigations that could lead to that could tie her disappearance into a wider crime spree. Tips generated by the system have led several digs in the area which have failed to uncover her remains. Says they've received over 700 tips from 500 wit witnesses, as well as having 300 persons of interest in 2020. They were receiving an average of two to three tips per month about the case. So, yeah. They even, they've gone on records to say they follow up on tips offered to them by psychics. Though, said a particular psychic who frequents posts on YouTube claiming to be, is claiming to be in contact with Esther Spirit has created nothing but issues for the investigators. So, and the mother, she doesn't believe her daughter's still alive. And in 2021, she has felt this way since the third day of the search. So, suggestions about what happened to her are mostly speculative, as almost no evidence is known to the public. So, there's a lot on this to read if you want to read some of it. I'm probably, because I'm just skimming through it. I don't want to read it all. It's so much. And this one right here is saying that people thinking that she was taken by her estranged father has been dismissed. So... And she said, no, she doesn't believe her. She was taken into some sex trafficking ring. And so. And then there's something, a relative said something about in 2005 to alert them that a man in their custody had claimed responsibility for the crime, but had died by suicide. One theory says that she might have fell into the river and drowned. And that's been dismissed because no. Um, so it talks about different things where people, they've had these different tips. And there's a. Um, some investigated by police after a tip that where she might have been buried somewhere. And talks about multiple suspects claimed to have spent the weekend fishing. Yeah, so they've got different places where people are alleging the body, her body might have been buried. And it talks about different things. It's really so sad. There's so much. And then a documentary, Chasing Ghosts, suggests that Melanie could be one of over 600 unidentified, like Jane Doe's, whose remains are kept in the Canadian morgues and cemeteries. So, which she could be. In April 1996, a 47-year-old man... Is that a man, right? Is that... Louise, or is that Lewis? I don't know if that's a man or a woman. Anyway, because I don't know if it's Louise or Lewis. Had been murdered 20 minutes north of there by two miners. Okay. So it's probably Louise. I don't know. Says the boy's uncle helped plan the attack. 19, April of 1996. 47 year old had been murdered. 20 minutes away from where she disappeared by two miners. And there's the names. Or this one was identified. And... There's this one's name, and sometimes, okay. So the boy's uncle had helped plan the attack, and Crick suspected Goulet was drawing unwanted attention to their family and that he had informed the police of their involvement in the murder. Went missing 6 or 8 November in what appeared at the time to be another teen vanishing. Body was found in a gravel pit in 1998 and was ultimately determined to have been stabbed 
The surviving brother and Crick were arrested for the murder in 1996. Okay, no link was formally established, so I don't know why this is here. However, a teenage girl who was incarcerated in a juvenile detention facility in 1998 said that he confessed to murdering Melanie, and he has since denied any involvement, so I don't know. According to police, Goulet attacked, attended a party in October, early November, where he had alleged admit to disposing of a body by putting it through a wood chipper. Wiretaps used by police to monitor them failed to produce any evidence which would suggest they had a hand in Melanie's case. Well, that sounds pretty horrific. And then, this is a friend of Melanie's family has had has been suggested as a likely suspect in the case. He was in a long-term relationship with someone, best friend to um, Melanie's mother's best friend, and they remained in a relationship for 37 years until his death in 2016. The sons and daughters were close in age with Melanie and her sister, Jesse, respectively, and they have been described as being like siblings to each other. Um, he worked as a driller in the mine, sometimes leaving that area for as long as four months to work in distant places. And he was about five foot eight, five foot nine, and weighed about 280 pounds. And in 1996, alternated between driving a white or gray pickup and his mother's small gray four door car, but it doesn't say what kind it was. So, yeah, and gray would, you could, if it's a light gray, it might have appeared to be like white. According to what he told his partner in life, he had been sexually abused by various young men, including babysitters when he was a child. He was also physically abused by his parents, who were both heavy drinkers and negligent toward his sibling, siblings, leaving him to care for them. He had been injured in a head-on collision in 1990 when his vehicle was struck by a young woman driving while intoxicated he suffered damage to his back legs and toes and as a result he had plates and a back brace to walk though he did so with difficulty and continued to lose mobility over time although he was awarded 600,000 in 1993 civil lawsuit he would continue to live with chronic pain and was put on a variety of medication including oxycontin before turning to other substances like cocaine and cannabis and whatever that is to deal with the pain. Much of the money he received from his lawsuit was invested in a business which later failed, forcing him to return in the mining industry, even though he was disability. Uh, on the weekend that she disappeared, him and his stepson, uh, Jason, had told his partner they were going out of town fishing with his brother Andre and Jason's friend Joel, but later said that it had been a lie and they had attended a motocross competition, but because Andre was a motocross racer and there were several race cracks active that time of the year, but this alibi was later corroborated by Jason in a 2021 interview, though he said, also said his memory of that weekend is spotty due to trauma of losing Melanie. Andre has denied any memory of where they had gone that weekend. Joel has said he was at a large house party that weekend, and if they had attended any motocross competition, it would, could have only been during the day. And at some point, he told his partner that he had spent some time at the bar that weekend without Jason or Joel. So, does that mean he was with Andre? So they returned home sometime between midnight and 1600 on September. And that afternoon, he told several neighbors he was assisting with the search and even borrowed his friend's dog to offer his service to the police, which they confirmed is true. The day after she was reporting missing, her grandmother had a nerving encounter with him when he came into Melanie's residence basement to smoke a cigarette, which she considered odd as he had never been down there before. And 
Melanie's mother did not allow smoking in her home, but he went right in there and went down there and smoked a cigarette. Um, three days into the investigation, he commented to the grandmother that the person who had harmed her daughter would have to be very strong as she was capable of defending herself. And to prove his point, he showed the grandmother the deep nail marks on his arm, which he said that Melanie had made while they were play fighting. At this point, the mother became very suspicious of him, as according to his own version of events, he had gone out of town on the Friday before she disappeared and only returned after she was reported missing, make it an impossible for him to have encountered her on the morning she had visited his home. When pressed, he told the mother he had seen her daughter working as a stripper, <sighs> even though later this was found to have been a black woman who bore a passing resemblance to Melanie. In the years following these interactions, the mother distanced her family from that man over her suspicions. Well, duh, he's got, I hope she went to the police and told them, hey, he's got fingernail marks, and he's saying that she caused the fingernail marks. They're fresh fingernail marks. So, yeah, of course he did it. On two occasions, he called the mother while in a hotel room threatening suicide. Well, let him kill himself. On both occasions, the mother, I guess it's, I don't know why they just keep saying the last name, attended to him, believing he was prepared to make a confession about his role in the case, but he did not. Other people who knew him have also, and I don't know how to pronounce his last name, have also voiced their suspicions about the scratches on his arm, which extended from his wrist to his elbow. He recalls him showing her the marks the afternoon. Oh, you, I bet he strangled her, and she was trying to get his hands off of her neck, and oh my goodness, that's horrific saying she had made them while they were play fighting, though she could not understand when they would have seen each other as the marks looked fresh. Later that day, he told the neighbor that the marks were caused by him brushing up against branches while looking for Melanie in the woods. So they looked like they were one or two days old as they were just starting to scab, but they scrapped pretty quick. I don't see how you could tell what hell they were. I believe they were caused by nail scratches. And no, nobody witnessed him play fighting with Melanie. So he had a long history of making sexual advances against minors. So not everyone in his life was aware of the extent of his behavior. His partner was aware of at least a few occasions on which he had made advances toward her daughter's friends. And some friends knew he was a pedophile. Lionel Martel, if I'm pronouncing this right, later told media that he had warned his friend not to make sexual advances toward teenage girls and later in life. But he would occasionally, while under the influence of drug, mention Melanie and another girl, like maybe they killed two of them, their names while saying they will never find them. So he might have killed two people. And he spent several months in prison for drugging and sexually abusing one of Martel's nieces, though he had lied about his whereabouts after being released and told Martel he had been working on his uncle's farm in Alberta. A friend later told police that on one occasion when he had spotted an unfamiliar black girl in town, he commented that he had an affinity for black chocolate. Um... His daughter has said it was very apparent that he was a sexual predator for underage girls and as a teenager she would have to check on her friends to be sure they made it home if he had given them a ride. In 2021 interview, Chartrand stated that six of her friends had come forward to describe him as sexually harassing and assaulting them. At least one of the girls harassed was aware of other girls he had abused before being abused herself. Yes. On one occasion around 2000, he followed one of the daughter's friends into a sunroom of his house and told the girl he would like to make, I don't want to read that, and he had a falling out with his brother. So around this time with at least one of them making it clear he's no longer around, allowed to be around his niece. Years later, 
He was briefly jailed for sexually assaulting one of his daughter's friends in the family home as his daughters and partners were asleep. He was acquitted in, ca- in court and released. What? In 2014, he was sentenced to serve time in prison after pleading guilty to a similar offense and was released after several months. His stepson also said his uncle Andre, who was allegedly with him the weekend of Melanie's disappearance, had made sexual comments about a 12-year-old neighbor in the early 1990s. So maybe that's the other girl and maybe it was them too. I don't know. On multiple occasions, he lured teenage girls to a hotel room, often telling them or their families that he needed a babysitter for a fictional child. Around 10 years after Melanie's disappearance, he lured her younger sister, Jessie, with a similar trick. His father had recently died, and he offered the young girl work cleaning his mother's house that afternoon, but instead drove her to a hotel on the outskirts and coaxed her inside. He locked the door and consumed a lot of cocaine while stripping naked and making sexual comments towards Jessie alternating between sitting on the bed and in the room's hot tub for hours as Jesse pretended to text on her phone and to avoid his advances. Jesse had plans to meet her boyfriend at around 14.45 that day, which is 3.45, and finally convinced him to let her leave around this deadline. She completely cut ties with him and the Chartrand family after this incident, which convinced her he could have had a role in her sister's disappearance. Well, yeah, he had the scratches. So, yeah, he's the one who did it. That's my opinion. But, yeah, I strongly believe so. Uh, One woman, known only as Josephine, interviewed, stated that he had come to Sudbury and arranged for her to babysit for his girlfriend at a remote hotel, but confessed this was a lie while driving her there, then spent the next two hours commenting on her body while drinking heavily. According to Josephine, he later spread rumors that they had sex that night, and his behavior had led her to believe that he was responsible for assaulting Melanie, saying that he may have tried a similar plot on Melanie, and Melanie may have reacted violently if she rebuked him. So... In 2012, he arranged for a teenage girl to babysit his granddaughter, which she found out to be a lie when she arrived at his hotel room, and he began making sexual advances. The girl later pressed charges, and he was eventually sentenced to serve time in prison. And this just goes on and on and on and on about the stuff that he's done. So... He committing... What is this? In 2012, for making death threats, committing assault with a vehicle, possessing an illegal taser, and violating the time of his parole in 2013 for sexual interference with someone under the age of 16. And while he was in prison, he was visited by the mother who directly asked about his involvement in her daughter's case, but he said he could never hurt Melanie and suggested that somebody else had murdered her. So... Yeah, it seems like he would never admit to it to the, her mother, so. I don't know. So it said following his death. So I skipped a bunch of this if you want to read it. And then it said following the death, the family said they had come into possessions of medical records, which said indicated disassociative identity disorder, but. I don't know, they're saying that things happened before before that, so I don't know. And there's a lot, there's a lot. And they consider him to be the prime, the mother considers, the mother maintains that she considers him to be the prime suspect in her daughter's disappearance. And she doesn't believe that the police made an appropriate effort to investigate him. Because he's got the scratches on his arms. He's got scratches on his arms. So. Yeah. And she has alleged that her daughter's body may be buried on one of the friend's properties. Which they purchased in May of 1996. And allowed him to have access freely for many years. So. I don't know. And then there's other ones. It talks about mistaken identity. 
1996, Gulay and his half-brother, I don't know how to pronounce it, accosted two black girls with racial slurs and threatened to shoot them. One of the targeted individuals, known only as Sarah, was often said to look very similar to Melanie to the point that they were often confused for each other by locals and even their own relatives. Uh, Sarah occasionally brought drugs from the brothers. On Friday, September 27, 1996, Sarah told a friend that she owed money to a local drug dealer and was afraid for her life, telling the confidant not to be surprised if she went missing over the weekend. She had also spoken to police before the incident, providing information on the activities of a group of three local boys. Sarah, who lived on Pine Avenue at the time, was not made aware of Melanie's disappearance until Monday, September 30th. At this point, Sarah, who also went by the name Sierra, began to refer to herself as Melanie and dress in clothes similar to those worn by Melanie on the night of her disappearance. Days after the incident, Sarah told several people that she was Melanie at a bowling alley. Sarah moved to North Bay sometime after 1998 and appears in her school yearbooks in 1997 and 1998, despite a rumor which she allegedly left town weeks after the disappearance. She then moved to Vancouver. Aside from voicemail left for her mother February 2020, she has cut off all contact with her friends and family. Her current whereabouts and status are unknown. Peers who attend the school in the area at the same time as Melanie have doubted someone would ever target over a debt. Besides, the other guy has scratches all up and down his arms, so yeah, I don't know. Melanie and Sarah were familiar with each other with the only and with the only other black girl in town in 2020. The third person in this group rejected the notion that Melanie was a target of a spontaneous spontaneous racial hate crime. So and this just goes on and on and on. So and then it talks about drunk drivers in case somebody might have hit her and taken the body and hit it. it talks about white supremacist groups. So and, and it goes on with different different possibilities and who might have done it. So you can go through and read this because this has been already a long video. It it says that the teenagers that were hanging out with her, none of them are considered suspects. So yeah, and it talks about them taking lie detector tests and talks about a stranger because of the bars in the area were only a block away. And they talk about witnesses described two female hitchhikers. But yeah, there were three there were three weddings and possibly a small party going on. So there was a lot going on, but I still think that you know, the one guy with the scratches from his elbow to his wrist that's who I, I think I think the mother is right I think that's who did it that's what I think in my opinion but you can read on and about it so th they talk about this suspicious vehicle encountered by the two girls that were there the night that she disappeared and they talked somewhere they talk about um a white delivery van pulled over to ask somebody for directions and they couldn't remember which street the van was large and rusted with a sliding side door and no windows the location where they pulled over was about 100 meters from her residence the driver and his passenger reported as being men in their 30s or 40s both unkempt and at least one of them was wearing just an undershirt she found the conversation uncomfortable and when her dog began to bark aggressively at the vehicle she declined to give them any information and the men drove off the van was also spotted that night by a video store employee the employee who was the sister of one of the male friends melanie was with had seen melanie earlier that day and had even paid for the Maybe the group rented. One man, either the driver or the passenger, entered the rental store around 22.30 hours. And that you have to remember, 2400 is the 
midnight and loitered around ignoring the clerk's offer to help him and find what he was looking for and left without ever saying a word he was wearing blue work pants which looked unwashed and discolored a grungy white shirt which had been extensively yellowed and work boots he was described as being an average build with dirty blonde hair in his mid-forties standing roughly five foot eight five foot nine she described the van as being beat up a white utility van with no signage and was unable to inconspicuously take down the license plate number because it was parked in a dark spot after the man left the clerk who would normally walk home but felt threatened by the stranger's odd behavior called her father to pick her up when the store closed around 11 o'clock at night police did not question the clerk until 2020 why would they wait so long So, yeah, that's really suspicious. And then there was another vehicle in the area that was a light-colored white, light blue or light gray car with a vinyl roof, possibly an older model. And it could have been a Chevy Monte Carlo. So, but these are newer cars. So, the vehicle was last seen by witnesses on the Armstrong Bridge at 2 a.m. It's unknown if this vehicle, the white van, or the slowly moving car encountered Melanie's was encountered by Melanie's friend on Pine Avenue are connected to each other or the disappearance. They don't know. They don't know. They're saying, you know, maybe it was a serial killer because they had serial killers. And then they talk about the serial killers. There was at least, there was as many as three known serial killers that were active in the area. So... But I still think it was the one with the scratches. From his wrist to his elbow. But I don't know. It could have been the white van. You always hear about some white creepy van. So then it talks about the initial reaction. And you can read this on in Wikipedia. Because it's got a lot to read. And I, I don't feel it. I'll, I'm going to. I'll start here. And you can pause it. And read it if you want to. Because I don't want to read it. Because I've read so much already. And then we'll go down here. And then it talks about. There's different places where you can watch. And if you're interested in the case by now. If you've watched all of this. You've got to be interested in the case. You can listen to it. There's references. And you can go to here. And you can click. Some of the links don't exist anymore. And some of them do. And they have. Different people have podcasts so that you could go listen to their podcasts. And I guess that's where they got some of the information on it. And I bet the podcast would be really interesting. I would love to listen to a podcast. So, and this talks, she was born Christmas Eve, 1980, and she was an honor student. So, and she was so beautiful. Look how beautiful she was. Such a beautiful young girl. And so tiny. And then Reddit even talks about, has a lot of information. So, and I'll scroll down and pause this. If you, I'll scroll down and I'll stop in places. So if you want to pause it and read it, you can. But this one has some good information. So, it talks about her getting the cake stuff and going to the video store. And her mom told her she hadn't cleaned her room. And go into Pine Avenue. So. And her crossing the bridge. Somebody said they thought this. So. And if she crossed the bridge. She might even have made it home. He might have been awake at home. Who knows. He might have been outside waiting for. I don't know. Nobody knows because we weren't there. We weren't there. So we don't really know who did it. We can only make assumptions but you know what do you think do you think he did it because he had the scratches and he's talking about her like she made the scratches so wouldn't you think that if he's talking like she made the scratches that she made the scratches that's crazy so but you can read this so much 
And it talks about the different things that may have happened to her. And I don't know. And then it talks with some sources that you could go to to do that. And then there's other people's comments about they spent time in the community. But I don't know. I, I think that I bet it was that one. It seems to me it was that one man, and I don't know if he did it alone or if he did it with one of his family members. So, and maybe that's why he never admitted it. Because, but it sounds to me like he probably did it because he told other people that he did it, and then he had the scratches on his arm. So that's who I would think did it, but I don't know. That's just my thought my opinion and like and here is again the picture it's just a short walk just a short walk home but you know you feel so safe thinking you know it's busy streets it's a short walk home it's too bad the phones weren't working that she couldn't call that's you know and people are just wishing they could go back and give her a ride or you know or go back and walk her home you know, and just done something different. That's what you always wish you could go back and do something different to change what happened. But it's, you can't, you know, you can't go back. So make the most of today and try to do the best that you can. And please don't forget to pray for her family, her friends, her friend's family, and all the people that this affected. And thank you so much for tuning in to my channel. Please leave comments. Have a great day. Bye-bye.